What's that? The Goodrich Facebook page. Don't they make tires? They haven't made tires in more than 20 years. Goodrich is all about aerospace and defense now. Look, there's a video here about their 140th anniversary. Let's check it out. Goodrich opened the first rubber factory in Acton, Ohio in 1870, setting in motion the growth of America's rubber industry. Back then, fires were battled with fire hose made of leather, which would often burst, bleed, and become useless. His solution? Fire hose made with cotton fabric and rubber. It pioneered the very first air-filled tires for the first American car built for sale to the public. See, I told you they made tires. Tell you what, let's fast forward to Goodrich today. See, they're a global company with more than 25,000 people in 18 countries. Wow. They make many of the systems all over an aircraft and many other things besides. Really high-tech stuff. That's a lot. They say if there's an aircraft in the sky, they're on it. But Goodrich is also on board tanks, ships, satellites. All right, I get the idea. You don't even know the half of it. They're into nanotechnology, green technology, space satellites, and they have a great employee culture based on mutual trust and respect. They treat you like an adult. And that's all Goodrich. Yep, innovation is in their DNA. And it started with rubber. Goodrich was a successful company making tires and rubber household products at the turn of the 20th century. In 1895, Goodrich opened one of the first research labs in America. Aviation was just getting started. In 1903, the Wright brothers took their first flight. And Goodrich entered the aerospace industry in 1909 with airplane tires. Oh, exciting times. Yeah, they were. In World War I, Goodrich made rubber gas masks, airplane tires, even airships for the Navy. You know, blimps. Lots of companies were springing up to support the new aviation industry. And many of the leaders became part of Goodrich, like Hobson and Rotex in the UK. With the First World War over, the time was ripe for innovation, and Goodrich was at the forefront. They invented the zipper. The famous zipper, first of its type in the country. And a Goodrich scientist discovered how to make PVC plastic and vinyl, which became a multi-billion dollar business. Meanwhile, aviation was moving ahead, and Goodrich leaders recognized opportunities to make it safer and more accessible. So did others like Fred Rohr, Cleveland Pneumatics, and Lucas. They became part of Goodrich too? Eventually. Then there was the Lindbergh flight, New York to Paris in 1927. And his spirit of St. Louis plane had Goodrich tires and Fred Rohr's fuel tanks. The airlines really took off then, and Goodrich continued its innovation with the first DI spoot, soon used by every major airplane maker. And in 1934, Goodrich made the first pressure suit that enabled Wiley Post to fly solo around the world at 30,000 feet into the jet stream. They also bought a small brake business, which grew into one of the company's biggest businesses. Goodrich developed the first synthetic rubber in 1938, just in time for World War II. Our development engineers have gone beyond the limitations of natural rubber with synthetic materials like Coraseal, a substance that fills many important uses better than anything else. Business and technical innovation yet again. Aviation dominated the war like never before for both Allied and Axis forces. Goodrich and its heritage companies provided people and technology to support the war effort. Things like prop de-icers, fuel hoses, engine mounts. Oh, they had their own version of Rosie the River to Ricey. They sure did. Then, the post-war decade saw the jet age. With the UK's de Havilland Comet and its Lucas fuel controls, companies began investing in the new technology. Meanwhile, Goodrich was selling all sorts of goods that people hadn't been able to buy during the war. They fly down the street, cause look at their feet. They're wearing PF shoes. The tough shoe that helps you run fast and jump high. With the Cold War and Korean conflict, Goodrich and its heritage companies were there, keeping up steady production on jet engine pods, wheels and brakes, the first gas turbine fuel injector, and more. So, the 50s were a good time to be an aerospace. 
Sure, there were lots of innovations to support all kinds of new aircraft. New products like disc brakes and hydraulic actuation systems, and lots of new aviation companies emerged, like Bendix, Rosemont Aerospace, Pico, and Monasco. All of which eventually became part of Goodrich. Yep. The company entered the space race through its heritage company, iTech. Their advanced cameras developed for the U-2 spy plane blasted off on the Corona satellite program. The Vietnam conflict saw over 10,000 helicopters in action. Goodrich businesses made the first modern helicopter fuel controls and introduced rescue hoists. The Vietnam War also saw new jet technology, with Goodrich on board. Meanwhile, Goodrich was still making tires. In the race to the moon, Goodrich made the spacesuits worn in Project Mercury and in the Apollo 11 moon landing. And Rosemount made sensors for the Apollo landing module. Closer to Earth, a range of new commercial and military aircraft took off with Goodrich products on board. The supersonic Concorde had a Lucas digital control and war antenna. New military and commercial jets had Goodrich wheels and brakes, evacuation systems, landing gear, sensors, structures. Oh, I get the picture. But now the picture's changing. The 80s brought us the space shuttle. Goodrich's technology on board ranges from landing gear to wheels and brakes, gauges, sensors, and even strut covers, rocket motor segments, and advanced optics. More innovation and more planes with new Goodrich products like advanced carbon composites, ice detection systems, digital helicopter controls, fly-by-wire actuation. So, Goodrich made a strategic decision in 1988 to leave the intensely competitive tire business to focus on aerospace and specialty chemicals. Well, that's a huge transformation. And huge innovations with Goodrich on board, like the Hubble Space Telescope and lots of new aircraft. Now the industry's global expansion really took off. Goodrich opened a service center in Hong Kong, and Roar opened facilities in France, Germany, Singapore, and Scotland. Then, Goodrich left the chemical business and transformed into a leading aerospace and defense company with major acquisitions in the US and Europe. Simmons Precision, Rosemount Aerospace, Roar, Coltec, Raytheon Optical, TRW Aeronautical Systems, which brought Lucas. So that made Goodrich the largest pure play aerospace company. In 2001, they dropped the BF from their name and became Goodrich Corporation. And innovations kept going. Goodrich was tapped to provide critical systems on more new aircraft. And they became major players in the military upgrade market. They continued global expansion with facilities in India, Mexico, China, and Dubai. They've really become a global powerhouse. They've even rung the bell a few times at the New York Stock Exchange. In fact, they've been continuously traded for a hundred years. And they're driving their positive employee culture throughout the global enterprise. It's really taking off. Of course, they keep going with innovation, like advanced composites and electronics, some of which only exist in the lab. It sounds like a cool place. So what's next for Goodrich? Plenty. They're developing key systems for new aircraft and unmanned aerial vehicles, even submarines reconnaissance and space systems, and advanced products for new business jets and helicopters. It's like you said, innovation is in their DNA. That's good, Rich. Who knows where the next 140 years will take them? Hey, let's get another cup of coffee.